Good evening. Welcome to Second, this beautiful Sunday afternoon. Lots of sunshine. Uh, let's start our song service by turning to number 571 in your Burgundy songbook. 571, Trust and Obey. And we're going to do verses 1, 3, 4, and 5. 1, 3, 4, and 5 of 571. <laughs>
to 354. 354, I cannot tell, and we will do all three verses. church. What a privilege it is for us to be here again this evening to worship the Lord our God, the great I am that I am, and to come together as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Our call to worship this, this evening comes from Psalm 122, the first two verses. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. And now if you would please stand to receive God's greeting as we come into his courts. Grace to you and peace in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together silently.
And now let's turn in our Psalter hymnals to number 313, and we'll sing, We Praise Thee, O God. Now let's say together and profess our faith in Jesus Christ together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Shall we go to God in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we are here tonight as your children. We claim you as our Father, we acknowledge your name as being holy, holy, holy. You have brought us to yourself through your Son, Jesus Christ. While we were yet sinners, Jesus came and died for us, cleansing us from our guilt, removing our sins, so that we can stand before you free, free from the, the chains of sin that bind us and hold us. Thank you, Father. We praise you, O oh God, our Lord and our King, for what you have done for us and given to us. Thank you for people of faith who came before us, generations upon generations. Thank you for their commitment of obedience to you and their desire and readiness and willingness to pass on to their children, grandchildren, 
their communities, the word of God in Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving to us the gift of faith by your spirit to believe. So it is truly a privilege for us to be together here tonight, following in those footsteps, but also committing ourselves to obedience to you and to telling and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. May your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we are grateful that Abigail Martin was able to arrive home from being overseas for several months. Thank you for bringing her back home, but we also thank you for the work that she did in Jesus' name to share, to tell, to live Jesus in a different community and world, and for the training that she received. May her example bring others, and may her teaching bring others to you, Jesus. We pray, too, for Nicholas Niebuhr. Many know him. Many know his family. He is now in hospice care. The cancer has spread throughout his body. Father, the, the medical report is that his time here on this earth is short. We pray for him. We pray for his parents and his sisters as they go through this, these difficult times and travel this very difficult road. May they experience your peace, your comfort, and may Nicholas as well, Lord, be confident in knowing Jesus, knowing that life with Jesus does not end with death here on this earth, but that life with Jesus continues in a far more glorious way. Bless them, we pray. We thank you, too, that uh, John Partridge's hip replacement surgery went well this past week, and we pray for his healing, his recovery. Give him the patience that he needs to be a patient, to take time to do the therapy that's necessary, and to wait upon you for renewed and restored strength. And may his testimony as well be a light to others who may have to go through similar circumstances or different types of circumstances, that you are faithful, and that you are good. Father, for those here who may have children or grandchildren, great-grandchildren, who are growing up in our world, we pray that they would continue to be tellers of the story of good news that they would have the privilege of seeing those youngsters, those youth, grow up into mature young men and women who will be faithful to following you and that they will use their gifts, God-given gifts, to serve in the world. As we each travel these days of our lives, may we be conscious of the fact that you are the one and only Lord who is our God. May we be willing and ready to follow you. I pray for this church, this congregation, for its uh, God-appointed leaders, for its pastor, his family. May they all be ready to submit themselves to you and to your leading and guiding. May they be courageous, Lord, to lead as, lead as, as children, as, as sheep being led by the very good shepherd. When decisions have to be made within this congregation, we pray that they would seek your will, 
courageously and boldly and humbly so that when decisions are made, it's known that those decisions were, were led by you. We pray for our denomination, the Christian Reformed Church in North America, as it deals with issues as well. We thank you for its history. We thank you for its leaders, near and far, and we pray your guidance over them. We pray that love for God may be first of all and love for neighbor right alongside of it so that we would be known as churches, congregations, and a denomination that loves God, loves neighbors, knowing that that is the first and great commandment and that all the other laws and the scriptures rest on your love and our love to you. So may your Holy Spirit move within this place as we continue our worship service. May, may we bring honor to you in all that we do. May your name be glorified, Lord. And may we have open hearts to hear what you say to us. And then may the Spirit lead us to be followers of King Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. The offering will be collected now for the young peoples, and I would like to offer a prayer for that and for them as well. Our God and Father in heaven, you do give us young people, youth, children, young, young men and women, young adults, and you bless them. You lead and guide them, and we hope and pray that each one of them would be quick to follow you as you lead them. So as we offer a part of ourselves, in this case our, our tithes, but may we also realize that you ask us to offer our time and our talents for the youth of this congregation as well. So may we be quick not only to open our purses or wallets, but also to, be open, our, to open our lives for you to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids want to come up. (laughs) 
awesome. Do do any of you guys do you, do you kick the ball? Do you kick a ball or do you hit a ball or play games at all? How about you, buddy? Huh? Hockey? Hockey? Okay. You play hockey. How about you? Baseball. Basketball. Okay. And uh, so, so in all them games, does anyone ever ever cheer you on? They do. They cheer you on. Cheer you on. Sit in a dugout and say, "Come on." No. <laughs> okay. Life is. Life is a. Uh, the Christian walk, I'll tell you what, it needs encouragement. And when, need, when you're playing that, your, your sport, someone will cheer you on. I don't care if it's the, the folks or your team or whoever. And uh, there's several verses. One is from Hebrews, and it says that believers should encourage other Christians daily to cheer him on. Keep going. Keep going. If if someone booed you, how would that make you feel? Not good. Not good. Not good. That that's why we need to be encouragement to each other, okay? In hockey, they will cheer you on, all right? Another verse is from Psalm ten. God is a great courager. And God hears you and encourages you. You're doing good, boy. (laughs) I'm going to make this short, okay? (laughs) And and what, what we have, here you go. Now, when your dad, when your dad goes chasing after geese, they're flying in a V. And do they honk? Do those geese honk? They're encouraging the ones in front to just keep going. Keep going. So that's our lesson for today on encouragement. Okay, buddy? <laughs> you can go back and sit down now, all right? And those geese are coming back north, if you noticed. And they're honking all the way. Yeah, that's a good sound. Along with the robins and everything else that's coming back. It's a good time. Baseball's being played. Yep, I know he's a baseball man right over there because we, we cheer the same team on because we come from the same part of the country. But <laughs> Let's stand to sing from the Psalter hymnal number 103.
Would you join with me, please, as we read 1 Kings chapter 21? It should be found on page 350 in the Pew Bibles. 1 Kings chapter 21. So hear God's word as follows. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. But Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. So Ahab went home sullen and angry because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, Why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He answered her, Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, Sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said, Is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up, I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, placed his seal on them, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people, but seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them bring charges that he has cursed both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city did as Jezebel directed in the letter she had written to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite him and brought charges against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth has cursed both God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, Get up and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, that he refused to sell you. He is no longer alive, but dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, go down to meet Ahab king of Israel who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says, have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says, in the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, Dogs will lick up your blood, yes, yours. Ahab said to Elijah, So you have found me, my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. He says, I am going to bring disaster on you. I will wipe out your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Baasha, son of Ahijah, because you have aroused my anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, Dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. There was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel his wife. 
he behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. These are the very words of God. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, for many people, estate planning is a necessity to make sure that their properties and their monies are distributed according to their wishes upon their death. If good planning has not taken place, family members can quickly and easily become at odds with one another, and hopefully none of you have had to go through that within your families, but if you have, you know how distressing that can be. In 1 Kings 21, we read about what can happen when someone desires to obey God's law and live within his gracious inheritance. And we saw how disastrous things can become when someone rejects God's law and chooses to live apart from God's grace. Obeying God's word does not put people, or excuse me, obeying God's word does put people in opposition to the ways of the devil and of the world, possibly leading to persecution similar to what Naboth experienced, but far worse than that. Living apart from God's word will lead to eternal results like what we were told Ahab and Jezebel would receive. Let's spend just a few minutes looking at Naboth a little closer. God had given his ancestors a piece of land in the Jezreel Valley in northern Israel, and Naboth, probably some of his ancestors too, had had started to develop this vineyard. Now, we're not even told if it was a really good vineyard or a so-so vineyard, but it was his vineyard at least. And all of that, that working that ground that had been his ancestor's inheritance was in accordance with what God had commanded the Israelites when they entered the land first promised to Abraham. In Numbers chapter 26, we read, The Lord said to Moses, The land is to be allotted to them as an inheritance based on the number of names in each tribe. So if you've looked at a map of Israel at the time of uh, of, uh, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel going into it, you'll see these different tribal areas, and they're all different sizes. That was all determined based on how many people were in that tribe. They had done done accounting, and uh, each tribe got enough land for the, the people in there. So Naboth was of the tribe of Issachar, and he had been given a piece of land, his ancestors had, and it was now his, and he had developed it as a vineyard. That inherited land was a gift from God, and it was to be honored by its owners. There was a covenant relationship between the individual and the land that God had given. It wasn't theirs just to do with as they pleased as far as buying or selling it or anything else. It was theirs to work as a gift from God. God had promised that land to them. That's why he could say, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. Because it was an inheritance from God to his ancestors, and now his. 
Naboth knew that Ahab, even though he was, was the king, had no legal, no religious, or no political right to his vineyard. Ahab was revealing the battle lines between obedience to God and obedience to the devil. And, praise God, Naboth obediently stands alone on the word of God when he answered Ahab. God had said, this is your land that I'm giving to you. Treat it as if it were mine. You don't give it away. You don't sell it. You don't loan it out to someone else. Now, if you read through the, some of the Leviticus and, and uh, Numbers, there are stipulations made for people who may be in financial trouble that they need to sell their land for a time. If you're familiar with some of that, there's the seven-year Sabbath for the land. Every seven years, if, if, if someone were farming a piece of land, they could take food off it, right? And then every seven years, they had to let it lie still. It was a Sabbath year for the land. But then they would start over again, seven more years. And then on top of that, every 50 years... So seven times seven, plus that next year, the land had to have its year of jubilee. And in that great year, not only would the land lie fallow, but if someone had had to sell their land because of financial difficulties, in that year of jubilee, everything would go back to the beginning. So you know, Naboth could have said to Ahab, I will if he were in financial difficulty, which we don't think he was, he's, I, I, I might have to sell this to you or to someone else in my tribe, and then after 50 years, he would get that land back. Right? But that's, that, was, that was an act of grace for people who were in trouble. That wasn't the way you were supposed to just do things because you wanted to. So when Naboth says, the Lord forbid that I give you the land of my father's inheritance. He was standing firm and true on what God had said. And Ahab wanted, had no idea of that, that, I'll call it a loophole, for, right? But if someone were in difficulty. That's, that's not the case here. Ahab just wanted the land for a vegetable garden. There's nothing wrong with it, vegetables. Children should eat them all the time. And we make them do that, right? And some adults need to be told to eat their vegetables sometime. Committing yourself wholeheartedly to obey God and to live under his grace, as Naboth was doing, puts us on the side of God's gracious and eternal victory. Though it may cost your earthly life. But God is the first and the last. He is the great I am. He is the eternal one in whom is resurrection and life. We grieve for those who lose their earthly lives because of their love for God. It happens daily around the world. But we also rejoice knowing that God grants them life in his presence. We're not told too much about Naboth other than that he stood firm on the word of God. And that sounds like a good place to be for someone who, to, to love God above all. I'm not one to, to say where he's spending eternity, but I surely think and feel very confident that he is with the Lord at this point because of his faith and commitment to God that we read about. Listen to what Jesus said to the church of Smyrna, which is recorded in the book of Revelation in chapter 2. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, 
and you will suffer persecution for 10 days, meaning a short period of time. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Friends, I believe Naboth lives in the resurrection life and is wearing the victor's crown that was earned for him by Jesus before he even heard the name of Jesus. But it was based on his obedience and faith in God. Ahab, on the other hand, had knowingly climbed off the rock, which is the Lord and his word, and found himself drowning in dark, muddied waters with his idol-worshiping wife Jezebel, who had no desire to desert her idolatry or worship the God of Israel. She came from a foreign country. Her father's name was Eth Baal, E-T-H, right? And then the word Baal, or the name of that pagan god, B-A-A-L. We've if you've read the Bible at all in the Old Testament, you know about Baal worship. So put that F Baal. That was her father's name. So imagine, you can imagine without too much thought where her, her worship was going to Baal, who her father was even named after. She wanted nothing to do with the Lord God. And as we read, there was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols, like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. Ahab was a godless, immature, spineless puppet king of Israel, the ten northern tribes. And just like his father, the devil, he tempted one of God's children to turn from being obedient to God and to run after something that might have looked like a profitable deal. Does it sound familiar that the devil tempted one of God's children with something that might have looked pretty good? It comes right out of the first chapters of the Bible, doesn't it? Where the devil tempted Adam and Eve, to disobey God and to take a piece of forbidden fruit and to think that that was going to be better than what they had. Friends, the battle lines don't change. They don't change when you get right down to it. The devil tempts God's children to look beyond the good that God has already given and to think that something in the world will be better, and you can have it if you disobey God. It doesn't change much. This spineless puppet king, after Nabal said, no, Ahab, I, I cannot do that. The Lord forbid that I do that. Isn't it? It's almost comical what Ahab did. I tried to read it a little bit with a little uh, spin to it. I don't know if you caught that. But Ahab went home sullen and angry and laid on his bed without his supper. Oh, poor Ahab. Isn't that ridiculous? This man who had a position of authority, at least, when things didn't go his way, he went home and laid on his bed without supper. I think I tried that once. <laughs> it didn't work so well for my stomach, and I had to apologize or say something to my parents so that I could get something to eat. But Ahab, sullen, angry, without his supper, laying down on bed. What a spineless man. He didn't investigate or challenge the plans of Jezebel to murder an innocent, for the crime that he was committed of, an innocent, God-fearing man and his sons and to steal his property. 
Don't you think that the king of Israel would have stood up, at least gotten off his bed, sat on the edge maybe, and said, Jezebel, that's just not right. right? You, you don't murder people and you don't steal. But he, had, he didn't have any of that in his heart. He later ridiculed and spurned the prophet Elijah, who was coming to him as God's spokesman, even calling Elijah his enemy, God's voice. Ahab calls his enemy. All told, his misdirected allegiance cost him and his whole family and Jezebel and her whole family their lives. Of Ahab and Jezebel, we must say that they justly got what they deserved. God's justice came down on them because of their blatant disobedience to the Lord. What we read, friends, is a very historical account of very real people, a real vineyard in the Jezreel Valley, a real level of commitment and obedience to God's word. It's the real result of disobedience to God on Ahab and Jezebel's part. Naboth was obedient to the Lord. Ahab and Jezebel were really that disobedient to the Lord. How would this story be written if you or I were the participants? I want you to think about that. I need to think about that. as we move through the season of Lent, we're drawn to Jesus Christ and his commitment to the word of God and the treachery that surrounded him throughout his life, especially at his arrest, trial, and burial. As we professed in the Apostles' Creed, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. And the Heidelberg Catechism answer to the question about the creed where we, it asks, what do you understand by that word suffered? The answer is that during his whole life on earth, but especially at the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. Jesus suffered because of his obedience to the word. He was the word of God. He obeyed that word being true to himself and being obedient unto death. Jesus came to this world to die for the sins of the world. The commitment and perfect obedience of Jesus brought him to his death on the cross at the hands of sinful, spineless people, though he had committed no sin worthy of death. Naboth died at the hands of spineless, godless people. Again, not because he was innocent as a sinner, but he was innocent of the, the crime that he was accused of. That whole, it's, it's another trumped up trial, just like Jesus went through. Jezebel writes these letters right, in Ahab's name, uses his seal, again, just depicting how spineless he was, saying, Proclaim a fast in the city, in Jezreel, there. Now, you proclaim a fast if someone's done something wrong or if a community's done something wrong and you want to get everybody together and they fast and they, they seek what it is they need to repent of and hopefully they'll repent and confess and be restored. So she calls the, the, yeah, the, the elders and the nobles, some more spineless people, to call a fast in the city where, Jezreel, or where Naboth lives and somehow put him in a prominent place. I don't know really know what, what that means. Maybe they put him at the head table or something, right? But then get these two scoundrels to come up alongside them because in God's law, you can't just condemn someone yourself. You need two witnesses. So we have these two scoundrels who say that Naboth 
cursed both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death, which was the the punishment for um, perjury against the name of the Lord, for cursing God. But he hadn't done that. All he had done in this case was say, the Lord forbid that I give you the inheritance of my ancestors. Jezebel working behind the scenes under the control of the devil along with Ahab brought up these, this Trump trial with false claims, scoundrels to do the work, and he was put to death and his children. We don't read that in this passage, but in 2 Kings 9, we read that his children, his sons also died at that same time, on that same field. Jesus, on trumped-up charges with scoundrels trying, trying to come up with uh, charges against him with, with evidence, they couldn't even do that, could they? But the spineless religious leaders in Jerusalem, along with Pilate, worked together for their own evil purposes. But since the first sin, the justice of God demanded death for sin. Ahab and Jezebel were blatantly disobedient to God, and their deaths, as ugly and gruesome as they're described, was a just punishment for whom they had been obedient to, the devil. The darkness that overshadowed Ahab and Jezebel as they died was just, but it was nothing like the darkness that covered the land from noon to three in the afternoon that Jesus died. That darkness was a physical, natural evidence of the justice of God against the sin of the world. I like to think sometimes about how dark it really was. It's getting, it's getting darker as we, we spend time here, right? But we have lights. How dark was it from noon to three? And how extensive was that darkness? I really don't have an answer for you. Maybe you'll, I got you to think about it now a little bit too, but... For the sins of the world, Jesus died. And as he was dying, the light of the world was taken away from the world. And darkness ruled. And how dark was it? Could you even see your hand in front of your face? I don't know. I think it was, I think it was awfully dark. I think it was dark, 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 dark because of what it represented. The judgment of God against the sin of the world in Jesus. Brothers and sisters in Jesus, those who profess faith in Jesus Christ know beyond a shadow of doubt that the justice of God against their sin was suffered by Jesus on the cross. The price of our sin has been paid by our Savior. And I think that Naboth understood something about that. He was willing to go through what he went because of his faith in God as a gracious and merciful and loving God. Ahab and Jezebel. Yeah, there's that little piece at the end there where Ahab puts on, tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. And the Lord recognized that. Right? So there again, we see God's grace to Ahab, that, that Ahab had some bit of a feeling, some bit of remorse, but the die had already been cast for his eternal position. God said, okay, you're still going to die the way I said, as your children and your wife will, but it'll happen, your children's death, all that will happen after you die, Ahab. 
So there was a, a bit of God's grace, but it, it wasn't that Ahab's response was not a total act of repentance where he turned to the Lord. He was just doing what he had heard people did, I think. Naboth's earthly life was taken from him because of his obedience to God's word here on this earth. Jesus died to provide us with a heavenly and eternal inheritance. Naboth's inheritance was that land, and he honored it, honored the fact that God gave it to him. Jesus earned for us not a piece of land, something far better, an eternal, heavenly inheritance. Listen to 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 6. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at that last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trouble. See, so there's the inheritance, there's the suffering, but there's the hope that even though believers may have to go through trials, grief, they know that their, their inheritance, our inheritance, is in heaven being kept for us. Listen to the descriptors again. An inheritance that can never perish. Never. Never. It's eternal. It can never spoil. A vineyard can have some bad vines, but our heavenly inheritance can never spoil, nor can it fade. It can never lose its luster. It can never lose its value. Never. That's the inheritance that Jesus has earned for us. Pictured as land in the Old Testament until the coming of Jesus, but now that Jesus has come and he lived, he died, he was buried, he was raised, he ascended, our inheritance is in heaven forever. How sad that Ahab sought an earthly vegetable garden while he could have followed Naboth's example and sought an incomparable heavenly inheritance in God's presence. How sad. How sad for anyone who forsakes what Jesus has earned for us and what God has promised us. How sad when anyone turns away from that and says, I think I'll go after that little bit better piece of land over there or whatever else it might be. So I think I can find better assurance in that stuff than in being obedient to the word of God. Well, I asked you earlier how this account would have been written if you or I were one of the participants. Another question. Would those who know you best be convinced that you are as committed to God's word as you live your life as Naboth was? Are you as committed to that word even when the devil throws something really tempting in front of you? Do you say, no, I can't do that because I'm a child of God and I'm committed to him. I stand alone on the word of God. So get out of here, Satan and devil, and with your temptation, because you're not going to get me, because Jesus lives in me.
Lee Strobel, he's a Christian author now, but he was a, an atheist at one time in his life. And he writes, how can I tell you the difference God has made in my life? My daughter Allison was five years old when I became a follower of Jesus, and all she had known in those five years was a dad who was profane and angry. I am ashamed to think of the times Allison hid in her room to get away from me. Five months after I gave my life to Jesus Christ, that little girl went to my wife and said, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he's done for Daddy. At the age of five, he's still quoting here, all she knew was her dad used to be hard to live with, but more and more her dad is becoming this new way, being a Christ follower. And if that is what God does to people, then sign her up. Friends, we have Naboth as an example. Many biblical examples aren't there. This is just one of people who said, I am going to be obedient to God, even if it costs me my life. Jesus wrote about that to the church of Smyrna, which we read, but there are other letters there in the early part of the book of Revelation where Jesus says to, I know your pain, I know your suffering, I know what you're going through, but if you stand fast, you will get the victor's crown. Congregation of Second Christian Reformed Church in Kalamazoo, I don't know all of your suffering. I don't know you well enough. But you're a human being like I am, like other humans I know. So there's pain and there's suffering. Some of it may be because you're standing up for Jesus. If that's the case, then I say, as Jesus said, Stand firm. Stand on the rock of our salvation. Receive the inheritance of God that's stored up in heaven for you. There's nothing like it. Amen. Shall we pray? Father God, faithful, loving God, God who has given to your people at one time a land which was an inheritance but now through Jesus Christ you've given us something so far greater that heavenly inheritance that we already are beginning to enjoy but we look forward to because we know that it will be well worth it. Give us the courage though to Stand fast on your word, because your word is truth, and everything else is a lie. May we, like Naboth, stand firm and need scoundrels to come up with a phony story about anything we might do against you. So may we live in the truth. In the name of the victor, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, if you would please turn in the Psalter hymnal to number 443, Faith of Our Fathers.
brothers and sisters in Christ, brothers and sisters of Naboth, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.